Welcome to Kakadu, Australia's largest terrestrial base national park, covering a staggering 20,000 square kilometres. And as the sun rises, I'm sat on the edge of this amazing wetland as a few purple swamp ends stroll past me. And it's not just the swamp ends here, there's 5,000 magpie geese, red-necked avocet, red knee dotterel, there's just tons and tons of birds. I could never have expected the scene that greeted my eyes when we arrived in the gloom. As the sun rose, it was like a veil being lifted, a feeding frenzy, a photographer's dream. The sights, sounds and smell was an assault on the senses. Red-necked avocets, dotterels and stilts fed on the edges, all offering up great portraits. If you want to find amazing wildlife in places like Kakadu, it's essential that you work with local experts. So during my time here, I'm working with Sarah and Luke from NT Bird Specialists. And Sarah's already pointed out a really well camouflaged bush stone curlew over there. But behind us here is probably one of the most bizarre species I've ever seen, a family of tawny frogmouths. So Luke, a lot of people think that these are actually owls, but they're within the nightjar family. They're a nocturnal bird, and what you'll find is that they'll go along, especially around town here, looking at the lights where moths and insects are attracted to, and then they'll just be feasting on that. And I guess they really rely on their camouflage during the day to escape any predators. I mean, they've got those huge eyes to see at night, but during the day, they just literally just hang out here? Yeah, absolutely. And so if you can find a roost, it's fantastic. And they're very, very cryptic, though. At night time, they're a little bit easier and flying around, but during the day, it just looks like a dead branch. Kakadu has always been traditional Aboriginal land, so who better to explore it with than Terence, who has lived here all of his life, and his people have been here forever. They've found axe heads that date over 65,000 years old. He's going to tell us a bit about the culture and the species that exist here. Because I'm Jungai. Jungai is mean a caretaker. Mangabo. Mangabo River. Mangabo. So we in, we in Mangabo. Crocodile, for us, Aboriginal people, um, it's like a spirit animal. Like, like more further, more further East Arnhem Land, saltwater people, they, they dance for the saltwater crocodile. They, they worship for the saltwater crocodile. Spirit animal. We can't, we can't play with him, we can't do anything with him. Only, only the elder people, they're the ones they can kill and eat. Only the elder. Spirit animal. Crocodile. Kinga. I'm here at Ubir, which is one of the most important Aboriginal cultural sites in the whole of the Northern Territory. And it's full of rock art. What fascinates me most about this is the sheer amount of wildlife that's incorporated into this artwork. Now, most of this artwork around here could be up to 5,000 years old, and we can kind of get an idea of that because of some of the species that are depicted in it, such as the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, which went extinct here in the Northern Territories about three to 4,000 years ago. But there's also other species painted up on the walls. There's stuff like long-necked turtle and barramundi, wallabies, kangaroos and wallaroos all around us, which still roam this area today. But it's not just rock art that you find in this stone country. There's a few species that are restricted to this area too, such as the chestnut-quilled rock pigeon and the Wilkins rock wallaby. I'm in this open savanna woodland looking for two species, one of which is in front of me, but it's proven really tricky to photograph, the red-backed fairy wren. And there's a mixed group of males and females kind of flitting about through the grasses in front of me. And the females have been perching up and actually preening each other which has been really nice, but unfortunately the males have been a little bit more wary and a lot harder to get a shot of. But there's another species here as well that doesn't sound that exciting, the partridge pigeon, but it is an amazing bird. It's a real skulker though, like that rainbow pitter we had in Darwin. And they go through this stuff foraging, so it's hard to track them down. They're not very big, but when you do see them, the subspecies here in the top end has an amazing red mask and they're really attractive birds. 
One of the main reasons for having a local guide is because you get privileged encounters like the one I'm having right now. We are a stone's throw away from a nest of one of Australia's top three rarest raptors, the red goshawk. And like the European northern goshawk, these guys have killing posts where they take the prey beforehand to either finish off and pluck before they take it over to the nest. Luke, what have we got here in amongst the prey remains? Well, as you can see, Luke, these birds are super, super aggressive raptors, but they'll take down things like blue wing kookaburras. Wow. We've also got evidence. I think there's a couple of pellets you can see. Oh, yeah, these. Just over yeah. here. These, you can see all the actual different colours that you'll find within the pellets, which are from red-coloured lorikeets, um, northern rosellas. There's also found remains of tawny frogmouth, channel-billed cuckoo, and also um, pheasant kukul. Incredible. These guys really are the kind of killers of the forest. Oh, they are. Just a top-line predator. I've contorted myself into one of the most uncomfortable photographic positions I've ever been in, but I think it's all going to be worth it because I'm waiting for one of the most colourful finches in the world to come down in front of me here. I'm listening out for the telltale signs of finches, the whirring of wings, high-pitched calls, and then once they come up into this pandanus above me, I'll probably get double-barred, masked, long-tailed, crimson, and the all-important Gaudian finch. You can't always predict exactly where something is going to land. In hindsight, I would have moved those pandanus leaves, but that's nature. I'm just happy to see these stunners. We're in the heart of Kakadu on yellow water. And like I keep saying, it's the dry season, so any water bodies like these are magnets for wildlife. Kakadu holds an astonishing third of Australia's bird species. And here alone, you can find over a hundred of them. We've already come across three of a possible six species of kingfisher this afternoon. Brolgas, cone-crested jacanas, even the cryptic black bittern. A species I've always wanted to photograph in Australia is the bowerbird. And I'm sat just in front of a great bowerbird's bower and he has been flitting about, tending to it. The male of this species makes this amazing tunnel of sticks and twigs that you can see behind me here with a carpet of objects of a particular colour. In this instance, pale snail shells and pebbles. And he'll bring more and add to this carpet as part of the courtship ritual, which he'll then lead the female through repeatedly to really try and impress her. In stark contrast to the surrounds of Kakadu National Park, we've come just south of the park to Pine Creek, where it's an urban oasis. There's tons of birds going around, but there's one bird in particular that's very special, the hooded parrot. These guys are endemic to the Northern Territory and they're actually coming down to this water sprinkler to drink. I'm not the biggest fan of birds on a stick, but when it's a stunning parrot like this, I'll take what I'm given. It's just starting to rain here in Pine Creek and that rain's taking the hooded parrots off of those unnatural looking sprinklers down onto the grass in front of me here. They're feeding on the little seeds just before going to roost tonight. For me, these guys have got to be up there with some of the most beautiful parrots in the world. Those males take some beating. What a way to finish our time here in the Northern Territory. 